is my great pleasure to introduce our Medal of Honor recipient, John Baca. And Also here with us today is Kathy Metcalf. She is the Vice President for the Medal of Honor Character Development Program Foundation. So she will be here to moderate and help along the, the program. You ready? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, but don't go away. <laughs> um, it is such a privilege to be here with you. Um, I guess we'll start out standing up for just a second here. Uh, thank you all for coming, for taking a busy day out of, your, out of your school lives, and I realize that it ends up being double work for you oftentimes, so we truly appreciate this opportunity. And it's such a privilege for me to get to be here with, with John, who we probably don't even want to tell you how long we've been acquainted. It's uh, <laughs> been a really long time. So before uh, we sit down and start with questions and, and answers, I want to get this started. John brought his Medal of Honor with him, and he said rather than wear it, he would prefer to pass it around the room so that all of you can see it. So I'm going to hand it to Marilyn, who will deliver it for you to pass around and look at. And um, be, be careful, because they sometimes come apart. But if you, if you look carefully on the back, you'll see that John's name and serial number is on the back of this, this medal. Um, if you ever come across one in a thrift store or online and it's got the name on the back of it, whoever's trying to sell it to you is committing a felony, just so you know. Um, so these are, these are pretty special things and it's a great opportunity to get to see it. Thank you for sharing it with us. Okay, why don't you have a seat? So these folks have, have already seen your, your um, living history, so they know your story about basically going into the service and then about your Medal of Honor action. But they're all teachers and they're here to find out about how to present this <coughs> program on character uh, to kids. So let's see what you're willing to share with them about, about your life. And you, you had kind of a, t a tough start as a kid. You said you had trouble in high school. And a, a lot of these people are high school and middle school teachers, most of them. What, what advice do you have? If you could talk to your high school self, what would you have told yourself? Uh, oh, I could, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, I grew up in the projects back east, in, uh, you know, back in Dorchester, outside of Boston. And, you know, you all you had to, you got in fights with somebody or, but, uh, um, eventually came, I, I ran away from home. I, was, I spent a year in the fifth grade, home for little wanderers and ward of the court or ward of the state. And sixth or seventh grade in a Catholic school, Newburyport, Massachusetts, and kind of carried on the same behavior coming out here to California. My, I met my, can you hear me okay? Little, yeah, speak up a little, a little oh, louder okay. if you could. Uh, I just continued uh, being a juvenile delinquent and uh, going out for sports in high school, but never going for practice. No wonder I never made the team. <laughs> Mostly visiting juvenile hall and with my sisters. We had a record at one time, three people in the family, over 20 times in juvenile hall. And then eventually I got drafted and went overseas. And, and when I come back, after being wounded, spending a year in the hospital, all the people that you hung out with, you know, pass this on to the kids, you know, that you partied with, and they never came to see me in the hospital. You know, you got loaded with, drunk, and had wild, crazy times, thievery and everything. Not one of them come to visit you, but somebody who came back from Vietnam, whether they were wounded or not, they would come to see you and spend time with you in the hospital. So. Sounds like that was a, a really hard way to go from being a, a troubled kid to being a grown-up, um, just all of a sudden. Yeah. So if you could help give some kids direction mm -hmm. now, what would you suggest to them? 
like if they're going out for sports or if they're involved in clubs, would you, what, what advice looking back could you give them? I, I tell my daughter, Kathy knows my daughter, I said, Megan, don't be, don't do the jellyfish mentality or to, you follow the herd, everybody looks alike, go the same direction, they have no idea where they're going, you wash up the shore, you disappear, but become a starfish, grab a hold on something, do you, stop being influenced by other people, and I, I mean, I love my daughter, I hadn't been there the first 15 years, but she tells me the wild party times with friends, get away from them, come out here, live with me, or you got a place to stay, we can write a book together, people love you, and I've seen you work with elderly people, you have a gift, spend time away from you, get involved, we could visit nursing homes, rest homes, that, the younger generation needs to go visit people that the uncared, unloved for, unvisited in nursing and convalescent homes, thousands of them are in San Diego. Two days ago, Sunday, I go visit my 88-year-old nurse, she retired a captain, she was in charge of all the corpsmen and the nurses when I spent a year at the Naval Hospital in 1970. And now she's in a nursing home and she has have 24-hour caretakers, but she was always like a mother and I didn't forget that. And me and a friend, we visited a 92-year-old yesterday, nursing home nearby where I live, and she just, just delighted to see somebody. And I go to a Sunday school class, I mean, they say, well, we'll pray for so-and-so. I said, you don't need, she doesn't need your prayers. This, this nurse captain, she was put in for admiral. She, all her life, she took care of the sick, the dying, the wounded. She's been a member of this church for years. She doesn't need you. She needs you to visit her. Go visit her. Spend time with her. And, and, that, and a, a fellow who visited her, a fellow named Mark, he's been 42 years in a wheelchair, paralyzed when he was 19 years old, riding a bike with a friend, 19, they both, he was killed, his friend, and he was paralyzed. But Mark spends time and goes, visits Andy in the wheelchair. He was an inspiration. I think I'm going to talk too much. I've got to slow down. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. That's, that's great advice. I, a couple of things that you said that are so important, I think, for our kids. One, service is about is about action, not about words. And it's so easy for us to sit here with this, with this great kit and these great lessons and look at the words on the page, but that those extended activities at the bottom, if we can get our kids to take these ideas and put them into action, that's really what's gonna make a big difference, not just for other people, but for themselves as well. Um, and you know, you mentioned visiting somebody in particular. There are convalescent hospitals all over, but there are also a lot of VA hospitals around, and there are a lot of lonely people there who yeah. would benefit from visits. Then the other thing that you said that I think, I, I heard a reaction throughout the room. Don't be a jellyfish, be a starfish. What a great metaphor for grabbing onto something and sticking to it and working with it. And so thanks for sharing for sharing that, and uh, I look forward to seeing Megan again and ask her if she's a starfish yet. <laughs> I have a daughter who's at the same age, and so we share that, looking for the, the rock for the starfish to grab onto. So when you came back, your life was entirely different than it was before you left. You spent a lot of time recovering. Who, who really encouraged you as you were recovering and trying to figure out what to do with your life after your service to this country? Uh, I, I just had some, a uh, lot of the elderly people that I used to visit before, a lot of Christian people I met, born again believers in the Lord, and they would be at my hospital bed, I'd, I'd have complications, wake up, there they are sitting, maybe hours and hours, they loved and cared for me, and, and, uh, I guess I was on the 24-hour prayer list and all these complications I had, God answered their prayers. And uh, uh, you mentioned your nurse that you stayed in touch with. Have, yeah, you, stayed, have you stayed in touch with other people that you served with during the war? Yeah, I, and I met a couple, a lot of Navy, young, beautiful Navy nurses or any military. <laughs> 
they get out of college, and, and you, the one Sandy, she passed away. She traced me down through Monsoon, Bill. I wonder if I was still alive. And she told me she had a, back, a black, a dark time at her time, because a lot of them would get abused, sexually abused, these young, beautiful Navy you know, lieutenants. They have nobody to turn to, you know, except the military. No one knows about it on the outside. You hear about it later. Senior officer, staff, doctors would abuse them and hurt them. And I find that out later. And, but uh, if they reconnected and found I was alive, and I started sending pies from Julian, California, <laughs> and keeping in touch, and some of them have passed on, but I want to stay in touch with the families, and I won't forget the families, but... Uh, you, you told me a story out in the lobby about, about meeting people at the Vietnam Wall when you went there, about parents of... I, I was on the East Coast, just starting with the post office in November of 82, and lived in Northern Virginia, and when they dedicated that Vietnam Memorial, November 11th, what, 1982, a couple of us, we met, and come back, just kind of know each other, you don't know, you didn't know each other overseas, but uh, we've met mothers all in their group, showing their sons' names on the different panels, and we wanted to talk to them. How are we going to talk to them? We're, we're afraid to go over and talk to them, but they kept looking, just waiting, you know, make sure we're still there, and when they shared with each other, showing their sons' names, and then they called us over, and they showed us their son's name, and then what we always wanted when we came back home and we put up a wall and didn't get we wanted a parent or someone close to us to hold us and not let us go until we wept. And that's what those mothers who lost their son, they held us and we just, and we cried in their arms. And then we hung out and said, you're our boys now, we're going to spend our time together. I'll always remember that. It was beautiful and just wonderful. And we went to some of the congressmen's offices with the mothers and, and they do their little speeches on an index card. And, can't you just speak to them from here? Why are you reading a little speech on your card to four or five mothers? Talk to them as real life human beings. But, but it was a beautiful time. And one lady, Eleanor Wimbish, she leaves letters at the wall. She's in a rest home. Her daughter takes care of her. She's up in her 90s. Every day, she, or she just come down. Uh, Billy Stocks, her son, a special day, no special day, we're just here, we want to be, have a picnic in front of your name, and people would read her letters, and they would, I would let her know, I just lost my mom in 73, you're like a mother to me, but I, what your letters do to these people that read them, and we, we connected two years later, and she was on the morning talk shows, and, and we'd gather up her letters in the evening so the park service wouldn't take them and get rid of them. And we put them back down there in the wall. And I reconnected with her. Her, her grandson leaves me a text. And my mom, my grandmother wants to find you. She's almost dying. She wants to hear your voice one time. And I got to call her a couple of months ago. So I talked to Eleanor. But we found new mothers, you know, from the ones who lost their sons. So. You know, we don't have any veterans in our, uh, at least when we, earlier when we took the survey, we at that time didn't have any veterans in our audience today, but a good many of these people are wives and family members of people who have served. And we always try to recognize that because it's so important to remember that when s someone goes to war, it's not just the person who goes, it's the family that's left behind as well. And it sounds like you came home with um, kind of a new set of family in the brothers and, and sisters that you made through your experience in the service, that you've kept a lot of those contacts over the years. Yeah. You said you went to work at the post office. What other, what other kinds of jobs did you do after Vietnam? I know it was hard for a, most of you Vietnam vets to settle down when you got back from, from the war. I, when I got released from the hospital, uh, I went up to... I took a couple classes at Cal State Fullerton, then Southern California College. Then my mom passed away in 73, and then 
I got on 11,000 Wilshire where your dad was working, and there was five, it was eventually four Medal of Honor recipients, and her father was one of my favorites, and he was gentle, loving, just had a beautiful angelic disposition, and of course it was John Finn, we know John Finn, he was neurotic, but we loved him anyway. John Finn was the first Medal yeah. of Honor recipient, or the recipient of the first Medal of Honor awarded in World War II for his actions at, at Kaneohe Bay, and you'll see him briefly in a video, I think, later today. Uh, lived to be almost 101 and was a, a legend amongst the Medal of Honor recipients. So it, it, I didn't realize John worked at the, at the VA up there, and Rick Sorensen, World no, War II. He, John didn't work at, oh, he okay. didn't work, he didn't but work there was there. Rudy and Ben and Wilson, oh, okay. he just stayed a short time. Then Rick Sorensen, I was the one, I never had leave on my records, I'd always end up going fishing. But Millie always told me I was his favorite. <laughs> I'd break all the rules, but he was, you were his favorite. <laughs> That's but, how we got acquainted. <laughs> you know, the VA, it's a benefits rep, you're filling out paperwork, and it gets boring, the paperwork, but you want to listen to what they have to say, and. I did a little time at the VA hospital in West LA, and I was spending too much time with the people in bed, and that makes me happy. I don't care about the form. They look for a quota, and they, I wanted to stay in the hospital because they liked me giving them attention, and they had somebody to talk to, but you got to meet the regulations. But I, I was off and on in the VA and off and on in college and back and forth at the post office. The best time I ever had was working at a living with my friend Art, who was next to me. I pushed Art out of the way when I jumped on this hand grenade. I put my helmet and everything, and, but we remained the best of friends, and he had a farm in Western Maryland, so I, I farmed with him, and we had farmer's markets. It was an organic farm, and farmer's markets, Washington, D.C., and ski resort was built nearby, and I got to work at a ski resort. I didn't know how to ski, but I learned to snowboard and ski, and we got all the arts family and kids, wife, everybody working at the ski resort. We loved it. The lowest wages in the world, but you, were, you met people from all over the world. And it was, a, I had the best time ever. I learned how to say hello in different languages, and, and you get beautiful letters from the guests that would come in with your paycheck. We don't know who that guy is, but he's nuts, but he <laughs> looks out for our safety, he screams and yells at us, but he organizes us. He's, we, we, we come back to see if he's working, and I'll always remember that, and I had fun time, and, but uh, that was the lowest wages, but you were outside meeting people. I hear the same theme over and over yeah. again with you, that it's about the human connection, that it's about meeting people and building relationships with people. And I'm going to um, set up your soapbox here for you, because I know that one of your current passions, and it has been for several years now, is supporting Snowball Express. Would you tell these oh, folks about Snowball Express and the work you do with them? Do, do you know what Snowball Express is? I think uh, it'll be 11 years or 12 years in, in December. American Airlines, I think they lost a couple pilots in air shows, you know, and they were pilots from American Airlines, and. They had children who lost their lives, and they decided, well, let's, get, let's make a connection with families all over the U.S. of A., even in Europe, who lost moms and dads in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think the first three years, they maybe had three or four or 500 families in uh, Anaheim, and, and I think the second year I got involved, and it was... Greg Young and Monsoon and Roy White, one of the pilots, one of the founders. They got the families together. And I want to be a volunteer this year. They'll meet in Dallas. And, and I just remember some of the families. And they never know. I sat with a lady last year. Her 20-year-old daughter was ran over by an Army Humvee in Iraq. She never knew the true story. So many accidents. And I, I tell them my dying moments when I'm on, on the grenade and it blows up and you feel like angels are holding you and it gives them a peace and I, and I have to believe, I let them know that your son or daughter had to feel that same experience but, and yet heartbreaking that they'll never see their family again. But 
But uh, I'll remember a little girl by a fountain, and my friend Greg is talking to the mother with the little baby in the carriage, and the little girl was by a fountain in one of the hotels in An Anaheim. And she wanted, to, she wanted to go in the fountain and get a coin. I said, what do you want to do? I want to make a wish. OK, let me go in. I got, I got an ugly Snowball Express t-shirt on in, ca in case I get arrested. But I find the biggest coin. I'm soaking wet, and I give it to her. I come out and give it to her, and she holds it. And she just pauses, and she said, dear Jesus, please bring my daddy back home. Then she kissed and threw it in the pond, and I know I got to be a part of Snowball Express for as long as it exists. And and when you're in, like in Dallas, maybe at a stadium there or someplace, you got your shirt on, your name tag, and you're walking, and you feel these little hands wrap around your fingers, and oh boy, and you just feel like an iceberg. And where you want to, where are you taking me? I'm I'm taking you to get a Christmas gift from my mother. Okay, let's go see mom. Let her know that you're kidnapping me. And. <laughs> And Neiman and Marcus would always give gifts to the kids. And, but uh, it's just beautiful. And then they always have, they keep in touch their Facebook or a newsletter, what they would do on the day that they lost their mom or dad. And some of the families have met down there, and they've, they've reconnected and raised, gotten married and raised in each other's children. Gary Sinise always shows up. He entertains the kids. And, it's powerful, power, Snowball Express. And I want to get to these young Medal of Honor guys. You need to get out of you, and you need to get with these families and be a part of it. I'll keep bugging them. They'll come down. John believes so strongly in this that I, I saw a couple of years ago, and I, fe I think Courtney was there. We were sitting in the Medal of Honor Society's yearly meeting in Knoxville. And um, Jim Livingston, who is a Marine Corps, retired Marine Corps general, and if you know anything about the military, you don't interfere with generals. And um, he was up speaking to the group, and John was sitting at the back, and we were sitting side by side, and he kept looking at me, and he was looking at the general, and he said, I got to go up there and talk. And I know that everybody else in the room was what kind of waiting for General Livingston to finish, which sometimes takes a while. And all of a sudden, General Livingston paused, and John popped up out of his chair and dodged between the tables like this and ran up beside the podium. And General Livingston looked like the enemy had stormed the beaches and was startled away from the microphone. And John popped in and said, I just got to tell you guys, you got to get involved in Snowball Express. And that was one of the most powerful testimonies for getting out there and supporting Gold Star families and the kids of Gold Star families that I've ever seen. And I don't know if John has seen the video. Were you, were you at Medal of Honor Day this last year? When, when, were you at Medal of Honor Day this last year when we had Miles Eckert? We'll have to make sure he gets a copy of the, of the video. Have you done Miles' story yet? So they've just heard about Miles Eckert, a little then eight-year-old boy whose father was killed in Iraq when he was an infant. And Miles worked with Gold Star families. So I'm sure, I bet he's going to be involved in, in Snowball Express as well. It's a, it's a great cause. I would like to give up this microphone myself and have you offer questions that you might have for John regarding the nature of what it means to wear the Medal of Honor or what, what your kids could benefit from hearing from, from John. So you can go back and share his stories. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Can she give you a hug? <laughs> I think after when we're done up here, when we get off of here, we'll do hugs and pictures and absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think John has one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen, and I think uh, it it came at a at a great price. I think that we all grew up at different speeds and different rates, and um, his story is really beautiful. A question I, over oh. oh, I'm sorry, did you see one? There's a question over here. I'm just curious. Um, I know your life story. I have it written here and I heard. But I'm curious, what do other people, like your family, um, what do they think of you as far as your character? How has it changed? How has it made you a better person? Did you hear her okay? No. How it, 
How do other people in your family think of your character, and did they see a change in you? Did I get that right? Yeah, so did they see a change in you after you uh, had your experience in Vietnam? I just had, well, two sisters, and they, they were party people, and uh, I was trying to get them away from the party scene. I said, if you girls get sick, you'll, none of these people that you party with will ever visit you in the hospital, just like my experience. And they finally realized that, and then they had their own kids. And, and uh, right before my sisters passed, they wanted to spend, they liked me, I'm their big brother. They wanted to be with me and get away from all the people, and I protected them. I kept them, you know, the most I, best I could. And my, my sister Judy, they had to take a leg off. She wanted to change her name to Eileen and go to IHOP <laughs> from, and then to have a pedicure for half price. I said, okay, we'll do it, Judy. But she always talked about her three boys because she, she did time in prison with her husband and uh, she got out and they took her three boys away and she came with me up in Julian four years ago and said, so you talk about your boys, let me get a hold of uh, my friend Suzanne in Denver, Suzanne Sagona, she's part... Right. Yeah. She found the three boys, two of them are in Minnesota, and they got kids, and one's in North Carolina. I'll see the boys, I've seen them already or, since she's passed, but I said, Judy, you're gonna talk to your younger boy, Jason. You never met him, 27 years old. They took him away while you were in prison, when you gave birth. Uh, she got to be, I saved up money. I flew her out there to uh, Minnesota. She spent a week with, she met four of her six grandchildren, and the boys were fighting over. She's staying with, Mama's staying with me, Mama's staying with me, and they all worked it out. And, and then she came back, and she passed away a few weeks after. But at El Verado Hospital, I, I saw the, the last moments, and she just had that beautiful, that, that smile that you hope someone has before they, they give up the ghost. And, and I, she must have had her boys right next to her in that room. And, and my other sister, Judy, she, Kathy, she was burnt out with drugs. I said, I'm gonna, I wanna be with you the best I can, you know? So, I'm your brother. If you look, you always talk about me to your friends, talk to me, talk to me as a brother. And I wanna be, what can I do for you? So, we got close and you, and they, they carry all that stuff so long. They weren't there with the kids growing up and had haunts them and, but I just wanna, if you want someone to cry on, Come to your big brother. I'll listen. I'll be a part of your life. So. Thank you for sharing that with us. Was there another question over here? I'm losing my hearing. So wait a minute. Let me get my glasses on so I can hear you better. <laughs> he thinks that's funny, but I have the same problem. If I'm not wearing my contacts, I can't hear either. So. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to take you back to the moment. Um, what do you attribute that impelled you to jump on that grenade? Was it your military training? Was it your love for your fellow comrades? And I realize it must have been a thousand things in a millisecond, but what now you've had time to reflect upon it, you could have run, but you didn't. You jumped on it. And so. What, what do you think that was? I, I, think, I think we all would have done the same. It's like you had that extra sense in you to protecting a loved one, your children. If they're hurt, you're gonna go talk to the neighbor or your son hurt my boy. You, you have an extra built-in sense of caring or, I don't know, it's, I remember it being there and it's, this is not on the program. We're, not, we're supposed to just stay overnight and go back home and, you know, take a break for a couple of days in the fire base. But I remember we're well, seeing it there, and, you, and I'm thinking, my mom is really going to be upset with me for getting myself in this <laughs> stupid situation. And I had called her Christmas morning and uh, told her I, had, I was a postman and did the laundry, so don't worry about me. And, you know, she knew I was lying to her, but but you, at least I got to call her in San Diego. And 
I always felt, oh, I went over, I always had my Bible, that was my body armor. Put it different places if I get shot, and I'd always talk to people, different, you know, they're into their own thing, and I said, look, uh, I just, what if you die on the spot? Do you ever think about heaven or ever think about hell? I mean, we never talk about it, but you ever think about Christianity and having a relationship with Jesus? And you need one for the next world. But uh, people said, we don't, you're kind of out of it, John, but we'll walk point, we'll be your backup man. I captured a North Vietnamese soldier Christmas morning sitting on a bunker. What a beautiful experience. And the boy who I went and saw Shirley yesterday, I sent him the sandals. He still has the sandals. This one that went to see someone that was a friend of his mom. Uh, and I walked up, I walked up to a, a helicopter, two GIs decomposing their body. I walked, I, you know, considered missing in action. They just flew over, they shot them down, no gunships behind them, and I walked up on them. You see them every now and then, and, but we got documents so we could notify the family. And, but uh, you always felt you had a guardian angel in front, being there, making decisions, being aware of, of your surroundings, the extra century of your surroundings. There's a grenade, somebody's got to land on it, do something with it, and that's the only thing I thought. I'm, I'm ready to go to heaven, so I better, if I don't do nothing, somebody's going to get hurt. That's all I could think about doing. And, and everything is slow motion, and <laughs> like you see, it's slow motion kind of time stop and everybody's moving in the slow whiz. Gee, what's going on? But I had no pain. It, it blew up and my stomach was coming out of me and, and my lieutenant's laying alongside me, washing my intestines out and taking the burning metal and, and I wanted him to let me fall asleep because I was ready to go into heaven. I felt that it was and that's neat to share with the families who lost, Snowball family, because they don't know how they lost their mom or dad, and I can tell them my moments. And I wish I would have died back then. I think of it. I start crying, because I've led a crappy life since then. I don't know. I think you've done a lot of good for a lot of people, John. And uh, I, I know some people who think pretty highly of you. And I think that you're being amazingly humble and that too speaks of who you are when you say that you think any one of us would have done it i think a lot of us would have looked at that grenade and not known what to do and um not necessarily automatically have done that and you know i'm, I'm in a kind of funny position because i grew up around you guys i i joke with the medal of honor with the vietnam guys about having been in the medal of honor society longer than they have because my parents brought me home from the hospital to a house that had a Medal of Honor hanging on the wall. Um, but that decision, I got to interview Bob Maxwell, a World War II recipient who also threw himself on a grenade. And when asked the same question, he said, it was a three second decision. And actually some of the same words that you said and that I've heard others say that well, somebody's got to do something, and you, and you did it. And there are a lot of people who, when faced with a decision like that, think somebody's got to do something, and it's not going to be me. And I, maybe that's what sets you guys apart. Um, how long were you in training before you went to Vietnam? Were you in the military very long before they sent you overseas? I got drafted two years, and one year was actually there were 16 weeks of training at Fort Ord and then seven months overseas. And the guys at the VA with her dad, the old guys been in 30 years, they used to ride me because I didn't, you should, how come you didn't retire? How come you were a GS9 like we are? I don't know, ask Rip. <laughs> <laughs> ask Rip. Um, you know, that's interesting. 16 weeks of training is nothing. You know, you think about that, that's one of our school semesters. That's from the time that we go back to school until we break for Christmas or, mm -hmm. you know, that's really no time at all. My, my dad went in in 1940 and was not sent overseas until October of 42. Well, the, you know, the war hadn't started, but he oftentimes attributed his survival through all those invasions um, 
to extensive training. But you guys who were drafted into Vietnam didn't generally have that. So I think that there was a lot of, of the character that was in the people who made those decisions already. And that's what we need to, to convince our kids is to, thank God most of us never find ourselves in the position of looking at that grenade and, and deciding whether or not we're gonna jump on it. Whether it is the saving somebody from the burning car like David Bryan or literally a grenade. Um, but the Medal of Honor, the idea behind Citizen Honors is that all of us, whether we've served in the military or not, have character values that we just need to dig inside and find. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty thankful that I have not been put on that spot. Yes, ma'am. There's a, yes, you, there's a... <laughs> Thanks. Great. So um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for your service to our country. She said, and thank you so much for your service. Put it closer to your mouth. Okay, how's this, Slatter? Um, I was just wondering, I'm going to assume that you didn't have a character development program at the school where you grew up. Um, so what do you attribute this character that you have? Because obviously you had it before you went into the military. I even think about, you know, you're sharing the story about your conversation with your mom and that even in that moment you're protecting her from worrying about you so I think of that as like selflessness and I think of all the things that you probably had to do just you know just to be where you are that was an act of selflessness and I'm just wondering how did you gain that character without this kind of institution this kind of program in your own upbringing did you get the gist of that you the the she wants to know where you think you got the kind of character that would say, I'll be the one to jump on the grenade. I think especially given that there was no specific character training when, in schools when you and I were growing up. And you know, you've told us a little about your family. You clearly had a, some troubled background there, although you, know, you wanted to protect your mom and from worrying about you. What in you do you think gave you that, that character, that strength of, of person that m let you make the decision to jump on that grenade? I, I, I think it was, uh, well, I know it was, uh, you know, you get tired of the street life and some elderly person tells you about the love of God. And I think that's, and I, that's what I wanted. And you, uh, I think going with the, they call that born again experience, I don't know. I think I always felt peace in me, whatever situation we were in and whatever decision I make, I believe I was ready to die. So it just, I don't know. It's, I remember going 20 years later, went back to North Vietnam, eight of us went back and maybe that prisoner that I caught on Christmas morning he might have been at our work site in North Vietnam building a clinic for six weeks with the North Vietnamese. And, and we brought honor back to them being a part of the land that we destroyed and the people that we killed and from the bombs and from the planes. And it was beautiful being a part of their life. My friend Art and I, we, we sponsored an Amerasian girl whose dad was in the GI and a lot of thousands of them there fathered by American soldiers left behind. We finally brought one home and her two kids and a, her husband and kids finished college. She opened up a nail business. And, but uh, just, uh, I remember at the, and I think Colin Powell was on the plane. You know, he was just checking out how we were. He was a wonderful guy and he was a lieutenant in Vietnam. He was in the firefights with us and he made four star general. And these generals now got a whole lot of stars. They ain't got no wounds. And they got no scars. They've never been in war. And they keep sending all these kids over. And it's, it, it's a heartbreak. They need to be in the front lines instead of the, the kids they send over. But anyway, I'll, I'll always remember, I'm getting carried away. But, <laughs> but the Vietnamese, when after six weeks working with the uh, building the clinic, and we all got sick, and they brought their home remedies, and we're up and about like we were working, you know, like bionic and, no, no, you take a break, you pass out and faint. Well, okay, stop giving us whatever you're giving us, but 
when it was time to leave, they picked us up and they just held us, muscular people, and they sniffed us. They, it was their sign of, they wanted to remember what we smelt like. That was their sign of affection. Then they, we would all cry and we're sharing each other's tears. And, and at the works in San Francisco, I think Colin Powell was in the back and just smiling. And they asked, John, you want to say a couple words? Yeah, I'd like to say what they, these are the words they left me. When you wake up to the sound of the wind, it's a calling from your Vietnamese friend. If you wake up to the raining, it's the tears of the Vietnamese worker who love you very much. If you wake up to the sunlight, it's the eye light of the Vietnamese child. If you wake up to nothing, that means the war comes to our land again. Just simple words. They're so rich on the inside, so poor on the outside. Barely made any money, worked 12 hours a day. You come back to America, we're so rich on the outside. We're poverty stricken on the inside. But I love living here. And I want to get my daughter, Megan. She's got to get married. I want to be a bridesmaid. She's got to come out, and we're going to write our stories together. We're going to write. Yeah. We'll work out. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. I think I've been drafted. <laughs> but, but she's still on the East Coast, right? Uh, she's still on the East Coast. Yeah. She's 28, and she's always a bridesmaid to all the girlfriends. And, well, Megan, let's, let's get you involved, and <laughs> I want to be a part of it. So. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so I wanted to start by echoing the person who spoke before me, um, and thank you for your service as well. Um, when I hear your story, what's remarkable to me is um, you spoke about having a pretty tough upbringing as well. And you know, I, I hear that in a lot of my students. Um, and I guess my question is, can you speak to what led you to have a life of service, um, despite the fact that you might have many reasons to um, turn around and say, you know, the system has failed me? So she, she has students, many students who had tough upbringings too, and she's wondering what led you, in spite of the tough upbringing and your experiences, to really spend your life since then in service and so embracing other people? How, what, what I do or the... What, what makes, you have this heart of service that you keep coming back to doing things for other people and looking out for other people and sending pies to other people and visiting people in nursing homes. Um, and yet you didn't seem to come from any kind of a background where anybody was doing anything for you. What yeah. has helped you embrace that life of service? I mean, I, I think that just from listening today, your, your near-death experience and your faith certainly are monumental in that. Um, is, is there anything else that you would... I, I How could we help direct kids toward that life of service, maybe? I guess if, I'm sure some of you have had those life-death experiences, you know, or you, you can't explain it to anybody in words. It's yours, and it's sacred, and it's like you've gone beyond, I, I, there was no lights or, you know, tunnels, but just something that was personalized within your body, soul, and spirit within, and life, and then you just survive it and come through, and I, I think your life is more special, or all the material things are so trivial, and, but just, I think I could, I, I don't know, I feel connected with people, because I've been there, I've been, I guess I had, I, I've been at death's door, and you're given another chance to maybe share with, be a part of someone else's, trauma or headaches or, I mean, sadness or, God, I meet so many people, their families abandon them and they don't, don't you have relatives? Oh yeah, but we don't communicate. But they'll be there when you die to see if you left them anything and so give me where they're at, I'll contact them, you know. 
I'll send something, make, become around, getting connected with your son, or you, he's got a 28-year-old son, a millionaire father up in Oregon, guy's gonna, gonna, he's in a relationship, he's gonna end up committing suicide, and there's no connection between the father, father and the son. And I tell him how I wasn't there 15 years of my, my daughter's life, and I get these hate mail from her and cussing me out, swearing us, I need to go back to Boston, make amends. And I think not being there for her, her growing up, it's changed where I want to be there. You know, now I know where I was absent. You can't repeat it, but I can be if someone, if, if they need me, I want to be available to somebody. So I am, hopefully, yeah. I think the biggest challenge we face as teachers is to try to help our kids avoid getting in those situations. And as you know, when you're a kid, it's hard to listen to anybody else. But maybe sharing these stories is, is going to help a little bit, hearing. Well, my friend, you know Bill Mimiaga. Bill, look up in his William, Mim William Mimiaga Facebook. He's got a million photos. He's 70 years old. He teaches at Stevens School in Long Beach. It's Tough kids, people, parolees, they're young, you know, they're, they're broken homes, gang bangers. He tells them, you're, he survived double breast cancer. He did 31 years in the Marines, and he's an encouragement for women going through breast cancer. And he tells the kids, uh, if you don't do, uh, I'm going to break your neck if you don't do homework in here. And they, they, they come up to him asking. He's like a father. You know, he shows them love, and he's tough, and, and they're, they're his best students. And he, some of these, some of the kids, there's one boy in and out. His name is Brian Alvarez. He's dying of ALS. He's skinny as a nail. He's at Long Beach, but he's home back in Long Beach. Bill brought him to the school. He's on a trachotomy. He could blow at him, he'd fall over, and he says, I want you kids to see this boy. Two tours in Afghanistan, he comes back, and now he's dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. 35 years old with a wife and daughter. He got exposed to what they call the burn pits. Find that book about Halliburton, burning waste and all these people breathing all this. 800,000 cases of cancer. It's probably why a lot of them quit in suicide every day. And it's a shame what the stuff the government hides from us, but. But I like Bill, they come, he doesn't want to leave teaching because they're rough kids, but he, they come talk to him, straighten up or I'll punch you, in the, I'll, I'll punch you out. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill, and they talk to him after. And I guess you, tough love they call it, or I don't know, laying on a hand in the name of the Lord, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a hard line. It's a hard line for teachers in a day when not only is there no, that we're so limited on what we can do with discipline, but we can't even hug a child who needs that human connection. You know, it's just really, really a tough spot to be in in public schools. Um, but I, I like your comment. What, what what did you say earlier about the hand of wisdom on the? Uh, the hand of knowledge on the seat of understanding. <laughs> Probably not anything we can apply anymore, but it's a great phrase. There are questions over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, having the experience you have had, have you ever considered how or if your life would have been different had you not experienced all that? Do you, have you ever thought about how your life would have been different had you not been through what you were in Vietnam? I probably would have been dead on drugs or in jail. Most people I hung out with, that happened to them. I probably would have went in the same direction. Oh. T tough life lessons. Yeah. There's another questions over here? Oh, I was going to ask, I'm um, military wife, so again, thank you for your service. And I think all of us would say we don't mind when you get off track, because I could listen to your stories all day. Um, but I wanted to find out, you've talked a lot about your faith. Did you find your faith? in Vietnam, before or after? Did you find your faith in Vietnam, before or after? And, and she's a military wife. It so. was before. Uh, I used to go to a, 
one of the churches in Sandy. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and I'd do, you know, go talk to the priest, and I started reading the Bible, and they couldn't give me no information, so I went to somebody to help me interpret, help me out what I'm reading, and I met some old folks. That, old folks always had an empty chair waiting for somebody off the streets, and I happened to come in this church, and there was a lady, and uh, I sat next to her, and I heard whoever was speaking just broke my heart, and she wanted to pray with me, and that did it. And then I got drafted, and they gave me a Bible, and and I talked to people. I was brave. You're, it's scary trying to talk to a new faith that you got, and people laugh. You, you know, you worry. We're fearful of people, what they think about us. But it didn't bother me. Uh, then it's easy to get away too. I've gotten away for. I got Medal of Honor coins. I know I don't have enough for everybody, but I had a Philippians 4.8, the one that you have, the old one. It was finally whatever things are true and noble, just, pure, and lovely, if there be any virtue, any praise, think upon these things. I got new coins made. Uh, Luke 15, 20, the prodigal son coming back to his father when he's a long way off. His father sees him and has compassion and ran, fell on his neck and, neck and kissed him. And I think I'm the prodigal son. I need to get back again. Oh, I got rid of my computer, got rid of my TV. I got all these religious books <laughs> that I want to read them. And a dog. And a dog. I got a standard poodle, Jojo, and he keeps me from having... I've had seizures all through the years, but I can go a couple years without having seizures. But it, when the aura comes, I'll sit. Jojo, come here, and he's right in my face. You know, he keeps me from having... Grand mal seizure and getting a bill from the paramedics for fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> and I used to have them up in Julian, so I moved out of Julian a year ago to San Diego. My friends wanted me close, and the paramedics would take people there to the hospital all the time, and I'd go see them. You take, you care for us. You're there, but go see these people when they're home. You get a, they get a bill for a hundred thousand dollars. Go see and check up on them. You know. But, I'm irritating people. You're, you're making waves. Great. I hope you get a typhoon up here and just do something. There are some motivating words. I hope to get a typhoon up here. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, sir. Can you speak for a second on the Medal of Honor Society and what it's been like to be in that group of fraternity for 40 some years? I mean, give us a peek behind the curtain, if you will. <laughs> You should have asked that question an hour ago. Uh, he, he wondered if you could give them a peek behind the curtain into what it's like to be part of the Medal of Honor Society. I, I went, my mom had passed away January, I buried her January 73. They had Nixon's second inauguration. I went back for that. I didn't have a place to stay, I got there late. You remember Marie and Jim Sweat? He was a World War II pilot, an ace, and I got there late. I was thinking about my mom, I just, and I had no place to stay. I laid in a hallway, and I was crying, and I was in front of Jim and Marie Sweat. They opened up the door, they heard me crying. I was thinking of my mom. They took me in. I ended up in bed laying with, I was like their child. And all these, I was the youngest for a while. And they had four WW1 fellas. It was nice, the youngest getting a picture with the oldest. And, and uh, some of their wives, Johnny, I can't find my wife. She's wandered off. Well, Louis, Louis Van Urschel. <laughs> Louis, wait here. We'll find your wife. Let's find Louis's wife. You know, she's wandering somewhere. But God, they befriended me in the old time. The World War II guys that more or less started the society, I think in 1958, they got a charter. And they, uh, John Marr and Greg and uh, Nick Oresco, New York, and they just, uh, the mothers, the wives, they, like school teachers, pull you on the ear, you know, if we don't, if you better come, if we don't see you, we're going to hunt you down. Okay, I'll be here. I never had a tuxedo. They bred me a tux, and I wore overalls to my first 
convention, and they dressed me up. And I remember the Scooter Burke, the, all the old timers were all gone, but they loved me, and their families loved me, and took me in, and it was nice. And you remember that, and, and these new guys now, that you can get an attitude, and they need to take wisdom from the old timers. And the old timers, I want to talk to you. You sit down, and, and you know, they, and they'll go, wow. Man. But wonderful, loving, beautiful people, and it's a heartbreak when you hear they pass away. They befriended you, and it's been always been a good connection. We get newsletters every three months, so let knows who, who's who. It's, it's interesting to hear you talk about the young guys because I hear my mom talk about when they were the young guys and the, the World War I guys would talk about when the World War II guys were the young guys. So we've had these generations move through and it yeah. takes a while to settle down after you've been you know, in a war situation, especially for an extended period of time. And, the Marilyn and Courtney, I'm sure, showed you the slide earlier. We have a slide that mentions with the Medal of Honor Character Development Program, this is not about glorifying war. And these guys, when they get together, they don't talk about war. They saw the worst of it, and there is not one of them, well, there's one that would glorify war. But, um, but we don't invite him to these events. Uh, <laughs> Ron Rosser, <laughs> um, but, but seriously, they, they don't because they saw the worst of it. And growing up, I would go with my dad. I was daddy's little girl. I, uh, mm -hmm. I went with him to everything I could. And we would go to all different kinds of veterans events. And I would hear war stories here and there, but never at a Medal of Honor event. The first time I heard a war story at a Medal of Honor event was in 2001, summer of 2001, uh, we went to Ed Freeman's Medal of Honor ceremony at the White House. And afterward, a group of Vietnam vets and my dad were sitting around a table at the JW Marriott restaurant. And I think it was Al Roscone and Mike Fitzmaurice one of them asked the other about his service in Vietnam, and they started talking about it. And that was the first time that I had, that I had heard a group of Medal of Honor recipients together talking about their service. So the books that you're seeing now, for the most part, that's pretty new. That's, that's a relatively new thing. It took most of these guys a long time to talk about it. And the fact that we have videos for Sal and Clint and and Leroy, they're some of the ones that have settled down, but we have some of the new guys who will, still will not talk about it. Will Swenson refuses to discuss his, his action. He um, will not do a video yet. So, you know, it takes them a while. But I, I think it's, I, I love sharing it. You know, I think it's great. It helps other people open up because if somebody comes up, my uncle never talks to me about it. I know the certain day or Veterans Day is get with them and cuddle up to him or something and say, happy Veterans Day, hug him and see if he weeps. He'll probably cry. The best thing you guys, it, it, recipient after recipient says talk to people, talk to people. And Rebecca was telling us before this that she got her dad to come to the Medal of Honor Forum in January and now, and he's a Vietnam vet and now he's starting to talk. Maybe. I think we're at, at lunchtime. It's 12.15, so um, I know John's going to, and his driver, who's kindly brought him up all the way from San Diego. Thank you, Nate. Um, they're, they're invited to stay and have lunch with us, so they'll be here for conversation time before they hit the road again for that long haul back. Um, but I, John said he would be happy to do pictures with you and, and collect on that hug that you asked about. So, John, thank you so much for taking the time with us today and for sharing your, your beautiful heart with us. I brought some Medal of Honor coins, but I know I don't have enough for everybody, so... How many did you bring? Do you I'll know? I'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, talk to me. I have I a bunch of my car. scars. I don't know if we want to see your scars. <laughs> <laughs> On the stomach. <laughs> just, you know, I found, came across a picture of you in that photo album that you brought, you're sitting there 
without a shirt, looking like a really buff, like, 20-year-old. I should pull that picture up. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's break for lunch. We thank John. Join me in thanking. Yeah.